Good afternoon and welcome to Stock Talk. My name is Sean Kaback of Manitoba Agriculture and Portage and I will be your host. We're glad you can join us for today's presentations, which will be recorded so you can view them at a future date. If you have any questions during the talks, please type them into the chat and we will do our best to answer them. In last month's Stock Talk, we heard about forage and livestock insurance programs through MASC. With dry conditions and a lack of snow this winter, most of southern Manitoba is below 50% normal moisture since November 1st, and some areas are as low as 25%. Producers have until the end of March to sign up for forage insurance or make changes to coverage levels. We also heard about livestock predation and prevention. MASC does have a wildlife damage compensation program for both livestock and crop feed losses, so contact your nearest MAC office if you have any losses and you don't need to be in forage or crop insurance to be eligible for this program. On January 1st, the Canadian cattle herd fell to the lowest level since 1989. Canadian farmers held 11.1 million cattle and calves on their farms, which is down 2.1% from last year. Canadian beef cows were down 2.4% to 3.46 million head, and in the West, was down 2% and the east 5%. In Manitoba, inventories were down 2.1%. So this, along with softer grain prices, will help keep cattle prices strong this year. Canfax is projecting 850 weight steers in the fall at 350 per pound plus, using a Canadian dollar of 74.50, current cattle futures and an average basis. So with March now upon us, many producers have either started or soon will be calving, making this an important time of year for cattle producers. We will hear from a couple of local veterinarians today to start us off with an Ask the Vet presentation on calving tips. We have Dr. Mark Filippo of the St. Claude Vet Clinic, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Filippo. Uh, thank you uh, for having me here, guys, today. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my screen yet here. Um, okay. here we go let's try that and do we share this again there we go there we are <clears throat> good. that's good yeah so i was talked i was asked to talk about uh calving tips today uh, at first, and um, I was trying to figure out how to approach this kind of session um, as we go along. And basically, um, over the last little while, I've been doing some calving live demo seminars with the uh, 4-H cow, of course, uh, Clover. And so a lot of common themes and questions were coming up from those talks. And so that's how basically I'm approaching today's session for you all. Um, so, uh, some of my tips today are, are really just interventions. Uh, when should we get involved in the, uh, calving process? Uh, but also I hope we'll come up with a few useful tips for you as the, it pops up through the talk. Um, first and foremost, uh, the biggest thing I try emphasizing during the talks was to stay calm and not to panic, uh, otherwise it usually leads to frustration, which leads to exhaustion, and then we make mistakes. So um, my suggestion often to vet students is to kind of create a routine. Um, so basically you might be gloving up, you're gonna wash the cow's vulva with soapy water, you're gonna get soap on your gloves, and you're gonna reach in, and then you start feeling around, right? You're gonna feel the pelvis, uh, feel for deformities, is she dilated completely? Is there a mucus plug there or uh, a calf bag? Um, do you actually feel legs or a head or a tail, etc.? And you want to just follow things through. Uh, you can, if you check early enough or because you intervene early enough, you've got a lot of time to, to check them properly and, and get that done. So, so that is basically the idea. And we'll emphasize that a little bit as we go along. The um, <clears throat> uh, calving, how do we do that? So basically, I'm hoping today we can touch on a few of these topics to help you during the calving season for the present and the future. So there's basically three stages of labor. This all works well when the cows read the book, right? 
Uh, we recognize the signs often uh, where they're restless, they're uncomfortable. Maybe you see that arched back or elevated tail. Uh, but what do we do when the things don't go as the book says? And the, the biggest take home here is during the first stage, the duration of the first stage, it generally lasts six hours, but can go as long as 24 hours. So when we see problems, logically, we should check the cow, right? If we saw her straining progressively for over 30 minutes, if she's just up and down and moving around, or we saw some strange bloody discharge or foul smells, it makes sense to check. But if there's been no progress past those six hours, I definitely recommend checking them out, right? Some veterinarians might recommend a little bit earlier, some might say a little bit later, but I say it's a good guideline, six hours. If you see them starting to act in that first stage labor and nothing's going on, best thing to do is check her out. At this point, you're reaching in and you're saying, has she dilated? Uh, does your arm corkscrew clockwise or counterclockwise? Is there a calf there and is it in position? Uh, let's say everything appears normal, but she still hasn't dilated uh, and the mucus plug is still present. Uh, she may be just early. So we wait, right? We keep watching her. We check her in a few hours and see if anything's progressed. So if things did progress normally, um, the first water bag should break. And this is the beginning of the second stage of labor. Right. So as you know, now you're seeing these stronger contractions. Hopefully you might start seeing the second water bag or some feet or the nose uh, or a tail. Potentially uh, the cow might be lying down, getting up. And as contractions get stronger, hopefully she's laying down more, and rolling and trying to push that calf up. This generally lasts about two to four hours. I often say like two hours for the cow, maybe four hours for a heifer. Um, but the longer it takes, the more likely complications will arise. So what do we do there? So our intervention at this point is basically, I recommend checking that cow out between one and one and a half hours after we see that first water bag break. Uh, the earlier we check, hopefully we can decrease the chance of getting any secondary complications like uterine prolapses, retained placentas, and of course, dead calves. Uh, you will never know what is going on until you reach in and check her out. Okay. And then the third stage of labor, pretty much self-explanatory, is basically when the placenta, the calf is out, and now the placenta needs to be delivered. Uh, usually there's the contractions continue, uh, but are maybe a little milder looking. Um, it averages about eight hours, but that placenta can come out in minutes or it can last uh, 12 hours plus. Uh, during this time, that cow is usually now grooming the calf, uh, licking the hindquarters, licking the head and the neck. So dystocia, it's just our fancy word for calving problems. And I, I usually divide this up into like two categories, the maternal and the fetal side of things. So on the maternal side, uh, there's basically three categories, and that's primary and secondary inertia, as well as abnormalities of the birth canal. So with primary uterine inertia, it really means that the uterine muscles fail to contract. And that's from overstretching, right? Like there's multiple calves in there, it's big calves, maybe there's defects uh, going on. Sometimes we'll see hormonal issues that might create this problem. Or milk fevers, just that low calcium level just doesn't allow the uterus to contract properly. And I do believe low phosphorus and low magnesium play a role in here as well. Secondary uterine inertia is where basically the, the muscles of the uterus are just exhausted because they've been calving for way too long. That's the idea of that, you know, more than four hours, more than six, more than eight, right? That happens. And then we run into these secondary problems like retained placentas or prolapsed uteruses. Um, we can really decrease these problems if we can recognize the stages of labor prior to that and when to intervene on their behalf. And then lastly, we have those abnormalities of the birth canal, right? Like 
the pelvis is too small or there's a deformity there. Maybe she hasn't dilated her cervix properly. There are uh, tumors that we might see. Urine torsions, of course, that corkscrew feeling that we get when we reach in, right? Typically, normally, we would be able to glove up and go straight into that cow and have lots of room in the vaginal area. We'd either be touching a calf or finding the cervix if it hasn't dilated. But when we go in and we have to twist our arm clockwise or counterclockwise, we most likely have a uterine torsion and you need to call the vet. And then for fetal causes, there's another three groups here of possibilities, right? We might run into uh, an abnormal presentation, which most of us would run into, a head back, breech, etc. cetera. Uh, we might get fetal monsters. So these are these birth defects or genetic defects that can create uh, various things. Uh, we might get conjoined twins, our inside outside calves, et cetera. And of course, lastly, fetal oversize, right? Just these big calves for many different reasons that occur. So this was a case of mine back in January. Uh, I didn't break the leg. I found it this way. Uh, the calf was coming breech. And when I pulled it out, I first noticed all the meconium staining that was happening there, the yellow staining. Uh, but the front legs were severely contracted. Uh, the one was torn, separated right off the joint. Uh, it was kind of one of those what the hell happened here moments type of thing. So these are things that you might run into that are just strange. So again, my intervention here is if you know how to treat the milk fever, treat it. If you know how to pull the calf out properly, pull it out. Otherwise, call your vet. Um, you won't know what's causing the problem until you investigate. Check the cow out, and again, check her early enough. So the Beef Cattle Research Council has been doing a lot of uh, useful kind of posters and videos and handouts uh, online for various cattle topics. Uh, calving, of course, is one of them. Uh, this is kind of a nice chart showing some of the malpresentations you might run into while calving. Uh, of course, up here, if I can get my little laser pointer going, so this is the normal presentation. We want that head and feet coming into the birth canal. Uh, and then we might run into abnormal positions or the cervix hasn't dilated or opened up. Uh, the posterior presentation where the legs are, back legs are there. Uh, and of course, a leg back, head back, or the classic breach where all we feel is the butt or tail, no back legs. So when we talk about normal anterior position where the front feet and head are there or those posterior positions where the back feet and tail are there, those are the only two ways you can successfully pull out a calf. Um, that's the, this is the goal when manipulating other presentations, right? We want to get two front legs and a head or two back feet and the tail and hips of that calf. If you reach in and find that the cow hasn't dilated, um, and you know that she's in stage two labor where that water bag is broke. My exception to the, my rule is you can check her out. And if she hasn't dilated, you can wait an hour, check her again. If she hasn't dilated, call the vet. Most likely we might need a C-section at that point. And of course, if we go in and you feel that corkscrewing again, as I mentioned earlier, it's probably a uterine torsion call the vet. If you feel a deformed calf or organs floating around, uh, call the vet. Um, and one of the things we talk about often in these live demos is if you've been working on that calf, trying to get it into position to pull it out, and you've been unsuccessful after 20 minutes, call the vet. I really do find most people get tired after 20 minutes. Um, this leads to, again, that frustration and then mistakes are made. Personally, I'd rather get the phone call and start heading out. And if you go back in there and get that calf out, you can call me back. I'll turn around and go home. That I'm perfectly fine with that. I'll be happy with that. But at least you know I'm on my way. Because the faster I can get there, it might make a huge difference in that viability of the calf and the calf.
So I kind of talked a little bit about when and maybe what to pull, but how do we do it? And I think we really do need to understand the physics of calving. And we need to realize what we do going forward is not only to protect the calf, but the cow as well. So when a cow pushes out a calf on her own, it takes about 150 pounds of pressure to help deliver that calf safely. 40% of that's coming from the uterus and 60% of that's coming from the belly muscles. But when we pull, what can happen? It only takes 375 pounds of pressure to break a calf's leg. And I can pull between 440, four, or 440 pounds of pressure. And as you can see on my list, that number keeps going up. So we need to apply less than 350 pounds of pressure to deliver a calf safely. So how do we do that? Well, chain placement is very important here. When we only throw one loop on each leg and pull, so say we put it on up here or down here, just the one, uh, all the pressure I mentioned earlier falls on that one point of the leg. However, when we add a half hitch to the leg, so we've got the first loop over the ankle, the other, the half hitch over this pastern area, so between the ankle and the foot, we spread out the pressure, therefore decreasing the chances of causing fractures and tissue or nerve damage to the calf's legs. Then we need to engage the calf into the birth canal. When coming front feet first, we need to pull one leg at a time, making sure the knee and the shoulder, so the knee over here and the shoulder, enter the canal. Most of us will feel that kind of pop when we do that. Then we repeat the process on the other leg. If we can do that, the calf's angle should be presenting past the vulva, so the ankle should be sticking out of the body, right? and the head should be perfectly in the birth canal as well. We should have enough room to pull that calf out. And while pulling, we got to remember that to pull when the cow is contracting. The idea here is she should be doing most of the work. We pull when she pushes. And when she rests, we just keep applying a bit of pressure until the next contraction. We also need to pull that calf in a downwards or down towards the ground kind of direction. This is because of the way the cow's hips and the calf's body are shaped. They don't allow the calf to come straight out. The calf's body needs to slightly rotate to make its way out. So if this is the hip of the cow and here's the chest of the calf with its spine going in this direction and mom's spine's up here and that's its sternum. So it kind of shifts over. And then as it's rotating the back end, here's the hips. And these are to mimic the stifle joints or the knees of the calf. It kind of rotates to kind of squeeze out. And by pulling it down to the ground, it'll allow it to calve normally. So again, some chain placements here on Buddy the calf. Um, when we have this posterior presentation uh, where you, you have just the back feet, if you can get the hocks of the calf past the vulva and the hips are engaged in the cow's birth canal and you see the, little, the tail here um, sticking down between the legs, it should be safe to pull that calf as well, just like before. So remember, double loop the calving chains. You need two legs to pull on and you pull that calf in a downward direction toward the cow's hocks or feet. Some other equipment besides the chains, uh, of course, the calving jack. Um, the calving jack is only useful if the calf is engaged in the birth canal, right? So as I described earlier, then you know it's safe to pull. The jack is not meant to pull on things that can't come out. It's a tool to help you pull when you physically don't have the strength it. Okay. The eye hook, um, 
hooks into the calf's eye orbit on the bone, not on the eye itself. Uh, it's only good with an experienced person, right? Like this is not something I would recommend using for, for everyone. Uh, it's meant to help steer the calf's head towards and into the birth canal only, right? Um, the better option is uh, the calf head snake. Uh, this is where you can actually loop the cable behind the ears on both sides, and you would slip the mouthpiece into the mouth itself. So Buddy's mouth doesn't open very well, so this piece is actually supposed to be sitting in here. And then you can throw a handle on the end loop, and that too will allow you to pull that head up out of position and into the birth canal. Again, it's not intended to help pull the calf out. That's what the chains on the legs are for. But it just helps you direct it into position. So I'm going to talk about two scenarios for people here. Uh, scenario one is the hip lock. So this is where the calf stifle joint, so the knee joint, gets locked up under the calf's hip bone over here, all right? So when we're pulling in that kind of classic way, um, it just doesn't advance because it keeps ramming in under here. And if we remember the diagram from before, the calf's hips and knees usually rotate at an angle to allow it to slide out. But in this case, they're sitting down, hooked up under something. So what do we do? So most people usually say they try rotating that calf to get the knees to come over the hip bones. Uh, it's kind of hard to do sometimes because, you, you know, there's not a lot of room in there. It's hard to twist them and, and torque them around. Uh, so what can you do? So basically, stay calm. Don't panic, right? I usually drop the calf's legs and head down, making sure that they're pointing down towards the ground, towards the mom's hocks and feet. Uh, and if they're on the calving jack because you're trying to pull and you can't, you just pop them off the calving jack and do the same thing. And then my young assistant here uh, was demonstrating on Buddy. What you do is if you've got the chains on right, you would put your foot onto the chain and you're going to push straight down to the ground. Uh, you don't need to hold the calf's head up like this. We were just doing that so you can see better. Um, but what this does is it changes the direction of the calf's knees on the direction they were going. So before when you were pulling, and often we're pulling at this kind of angle, the knees are just running into the pelvis, right? So by pulling straight down towards the ground, the, knee, the knees actually roll up towards the back of the cow, effectively rolling it into the birth canal. And then that allows the calf to be born. This is really nice on a live demo to look at. So try it. If it ever happens to you, do that. And if she's lying straight on her side already with her legs sticking out, same thing. You're going to pull that calf right to her hocks and you're going to pull the chains towards mom's feet, right? In that direction, parallel to the legs. And that should help roll that out of her. So the second series is our breech calf. Um, so again, that's where all you feel is the tail and the butt. There's no hind legs. And I kind of, I was calling it the two-hander technique uh, for most people. Um, and what do I mean by two hands is basically when you're presented with a breech cow, um, I usually will go in with one hand and push the butt forward in between contractions towards the mom's head, right? So we're pushing this into this direction. Uh, the idea is to try to create more space to work in and allow you to get the hind feet up. Usually when I have trouble pushing the calf forward, it usually means that I've got enough room. I don't have enough room because it's either a really big calf or I've got twins in there. So keep that in mind. But if you can push them forward, then what I do is I run my hand down the hip, down the leg until I reach the hock. And they're gripping the hawk or hooking around it. I try to lift that hawk up towards the birth canal. And once it's high enough up, I throw my hand back on there. And I'm going to push that forward again, right? In between contractions towards the cow's head. And then with my second hand, as I reach in, I'm going to grab that foot and kind of cup the toes in it to protect the cow. Because tears of the uterus can happen with this procedure, right? Like the... The tail head of the calf can sometimes rub up against the top of the uterus. 
and the toes can actually tear at different spots along the uterine wall. So from here, as I'm gently pushing the hawk forward, I'm cupping that foot again, and I'm trying to pull the foot up into the birth canal. If I'm successful in that, I repeat the process on the other leg, and then hopefully after all that hard work, it's paid off and I can pull that calf out. And what do I do after that the calf has been born? I check the cow for tears, I check her for siblings, and then I place that calf in recovery position or I get someone to do it. And the recovery position basically is the calf is on the ground and you roll them up into their sternum, so under their chest and belly, and uh, either you or someone else can do that. And then you're gonna pull the front feet forward to allow the chest to expand. So I usually, you know, bend them at the knee and that opens up the chest cavity here and allows for more air to enter the lungs. And I'm bending the back legs and I'm folding them up straight towards the ears. This just kind of helps prevent the calf from rolling over onto its side and just allows that maximum chest to open up for breathing. And then once they're in that position, I start rubbing them vigorously to help stimulate them to breathe. And I might also start poking uh, their nasal septum or their nose with a piece of straw, or I'll squirt some water, cold water into their ears uh, to stimulate them to breathe as well. It kind of gives them a gasping effect. And uh, with placing the straw in the nose, you're basically poking the nasal septum. And the nasal septum is this wall that separates the two nostrils inside the nose. So my angle here of my straw is a little bit off. It should probably be coming in a little bit more this way. Um, but the other technique is an acupuncture technique. If you're comfortable with it, uh, you take a 20 gauge needle and you're basically in poking it into the nasal septum itself. So you're gonna go through the skin right in this spot. And I usually just leave that needle there for a minute or two. And that just sometimes helps stimulate them to breathe as well. And lastly, uh, never, ever, ever recover calves by hanging them. Uh, this method causes more harm than good. Um, all the fluid that you normally would see pouring out of that nose and mouth is actually coming from the stomach. There's very little fluid in the lung and very little actually drains out. Uh, and plus hanging them, what happens is, is all the organs from the stomach come down and start pushing down on the diaphragm which then prevents the lungs from expanding, which then prevents air from coming in. So again, not a recommendation by any veterinarian. And also personally, I think it leads to secondary injuries. Hanging them here can be pushing up on the belly, causing some maybe hip and knee joint problems. So again, not worth the, the problem. And then I would like to thank uh, Manitoba 4-H, as well as Buddy and the calf and Clover the cow for helping me out with this presentation and the live demos. And of course, thank you all for, for having me and allowing me to speak today. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Filippo, and thank you to Buddy and Clover for participating in today's presentation. I, I'm glad you showed that picture of... Uh, not hanging the calf upside down because I think that's something I know when I was growing up was, was something that uh, was being done and and yeah it doesn't help to resuscitate that calf. Is there any if if you have a hard calving you have a big calf it's a weak calf is there any medication that you can give them to help them to recover or or to get up and suck and just to to recover quicker? Yeah, so often like I. I'll use anti-inflammatories. So typically like your Medicam uh, is probably my number one go-to now. Uh, not that I'm promoting the company, but I, I, I like that product a lot more, uh, especially on a, a hard pull. And I've also given it to the heifer or the cow as well, uh, just to decrease a lot of inflammation there uh, that they might be feeling and, and such. But yeah, definitely I, I use that on calves. Uh, and it does, I find it does make a, a difference for them, right? They seem to uh, feel better and get up and get going again. And then, of course, it's a whole other talk about colostrum and, and other things, right? So, but yeah, your normal routine that you would do 
for uh, processing them afterwards. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's an extra talk there. And how quick do you want to get that colostrum into them as a general rule? Uh, yeah, so basically I always tell people that I want to get like 120 or 150 grams of the immunoglobulins, those antibodies in the colostrum into that calf within the first six hours of life. Right. So that's a very important step because as we go longer than that, we actually, the calf isn't absorbing as much. So we need to pump in even more immunoglobulins into that calf to be successful. So if we can get as much colostrum into them prior to, to the six hours, that's, that's great. So that, that works well with the powdered stuff. If we're feeding frozen colostrum uh, to calves, Usually most beef cows, especially if it's coming from a cow, uh, a good two liters of colostrum should have that. Um, if it's a heavy milking breed, you might want to go higher, like three or four. Okay, thanks. I'll just remind participants they can enter any questions into the, the chat at the bottom of their screen. Uh, we do have a question. Is the use of straw or the needle for nasal stimulation only done in situations of the calf not breathing at all? Uh, yeah, it's um, it's basically used as a stimulant to get them to breathe. So if they come out and they're already coughing and moving their head and, and you can see that they're physically breathing, you probably don't need to, to use the straw or the needle. Uh, but certainly I would still roll them up into the recovery position. It'll just maximize the air intake. But if you notice that they're a little slow or they're not really breathing well, uh, stimulate that. That really would, it's just a benefit. Yeah, and the straw's not, straw not going to hurt them, right? No, no, not at all. Yeah. Go ahead, Pam. Just another question with regard to retained placentas and just intervention with regard to that. Yeah, that, I, I kind of thought that was going to be another topic too. <laughs> so I left it out of there. Um, yeah, so retained placentas, typically um, every vet's probably got a little bit different opinion on this one. I don't stress out with them if they're in there longer than a couple of days. Basically, sometimes that does happen. Um, my biggest goal there would be is to prevent an infection. I often will treat them with Medicam for inflammation. Hopefully that'll help release the placenta. And then if I had to, uh, again, we Sometimes I'll use like long acting antibiotics to treat them if they're starting to smell or run a fever at that point. Um, so that that's okay. Uh, am I going and pulling and tugging that out right away? No, it's not necessary. Uh, we've got some time on there. Uh, every vet might have a little bit different cutoff on there. So again, talk to yours and double check that. Uh, but again, it's not a life threatening thing right off the bat. And we know from data that if we don't get that placenta out, you know, in the first 24 hours or say seven days later, it doesn't make a difference on the reproduction later on. It, it's already been affected. So meaning that cow might not come back into heat properly or catch properly uh, on the first cycle. Hopefully she'll catch on the second one. Um, but saying that, you know, if you thought, oh, I'll get in there and get it out quicker, it doesn't make a difference. We have enough data that shows that. So again, it's not a rush. Uh, again, talk to your vet, see what they might recommend. But again, uh, Medicam for a lot of those will help just kind of decrease that inflammation and, and help them push that out, hopefully. And maybe if you can comment on uterine prolapses and uh, the procedure to follow with regards to if that happens. Yeah, so I always call it an emergency. Um, so because again, the complications from a uterine prolapse, right? Uh, these cows can start bleeding, uh, organs fill into the opposite side of the uterus. Um, we can get tearing of the uterus. So often once we see that, I, I tell clients to call me and then, uh, I make my way out as quickly as I can, uh, and safely as I can. Um, and there we want to just leave her quiet until I arrive. And then depending on how she's doing, if we can stand her up uh, that and restrain her well, that's what I prefer because I'm a taller guy. I, I don't like doing it on the ground. 
as much as I can. And then uh, we'll clean that up. So we need lots of water for this procedure. So I often bug everyone to go get a couple of uh, five gallon pails of water, uh, warm water preferred. And then, um, you know, I proceed by doing the epidural and freezing that so she's not contracting against me. And then hopefully we can clean that really well, pop it in back into the, into the body. And uh, if you do that well, that's pretty much all you have to do. But most of us tend to put in a stitch or some pins just to close that off to make sure it doesn't come back out again. If they're lying down on the ground, uh, then I'll leave them there. But then we're rolling that cow up onto her belly and we're frogging the legs back. Uh, so this allows the, the hips to raise up a little bit more and open up so I can uh, pop that uterus back in as well. Um, there too, I, I would probably need either some, if I'm not, I don't have my uh, table mesh table that I use for prolapses, then I'm sliding uh, um, some type of uh, bag underneath or plywood or something just to keep the uterus off the ground and uh, out of the, the muck and manure and, and straw. And there again, we just do the epidural, freeze, uh, freeze that well, wash it well and get it back in there too but it is an emergency situation um, a lot of people might fret about the vaginal prolapse which is just where that round pink soft ball is sticking out that's not an emergency we've got some time on it but definitely tell us about it because again um, I don't like waiting a couple of days on those to fix them that's just uh, uh, it gets too hard and dry and swollen we want to do them when they're fresh but if you saw it at three in the morning you don't have to call me at three in the morning. You call me at eight in the morning and we can get that one done. But the uterine prolapse where the whole uterus comes out. And if you've seen that, you've got those red purple buttons all over the uterus. That's the emergency one. Call us right away. Or Tanya. <laughs> She's on the line. There too, so. And sometimes it's successful to get the uterine back, uterine uterus back in. And sometimes it's not. Well, yeah, like most of the time we, we can manage it quite well. Uh, you do run into the ones that are, are problematic, that there's secondary complications to that complication. Um, but if we can get them in, uh, they can do quite well. And it's surprising enough, they will catch again in the future. Um, it's not, uh, it's, you know, not a, a reason to cull them necessarily, but again, uh, you know, it's one of those management things that you can discuss your, with your vet to say, you know, what do you do with her afterwards? But yeah, um, if it's a bad one, we'll tell you. And, you know, the best thing at that point is to probably euthanize the cow. Uh, but hopefully, you know, we don't run into those very often. So oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Pam, do you have any more? Nope. That's it from my standpoint. Once again, thank you, Dr. Filippo, and all the best with the calving season. And, uh, Hopefully it's it's successful and and less trouble than than other years. Yes, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So our next topic will be looking at vaccination programs for the cattle herd, and we have Dr. Tanya Anderson from the Gladstone Vet Clinic, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Anderson. Can everyone see the screen? Yeah, looks good. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank you, Sean, for the opportunity to discuss cow-calf herd vaccination programs. I've been a vet for well, a couple of decades at least, and I know that this is an area that we can greatly improve on. And vaccines are an integral, integral part of developing a sound health program that enhances your herd productivity and profitability. What I'd like to do over the next 15 or 20 minutes is just to review why we need to vaccinate, which vaccines we should use, who we should vaccinate and when, 
And then I'll conclude my presentation with just a few do's and don'ts, just some tips to make sure that when we're vaccinating, that we're getting the job done well and that it's accomplishing the purpose that we want. Kind of broken my presentation up into um, to groups. And so the, the group that I'm gonna start with are, are the, cow, the cow herd. And the primary reason that we want to vaccinate is to prevent reproductive failure, whether that's failure due to actual failure to get pregnant or early embryonic death, which often happens before we've actually pregnancy tested. And then like the picture to the side, abortions. This time of year or with prices the way they are, it, it hurts when you're seeing cows abort. And the two diseases that are fairly common in this area are IBR and BVD. Right now, I've had a client that's experienced an IBR abortion, and he's lost well over 10% of his calf herd. Definitely something you want to vaccinate against. BVD is a disease that can cause both abortions, early embryonic death, and it's also a cause of congenital disease. Congenital disease, disease means that calves have got abnormalities that means that they will either never reach their potential or they may be fatal abnormalities. And Dr. Filippo certainly showed some pictures of calves that uh, had some congenital problems. The other main advantage to getting your cow herd vaccinated is for transfer of immunity. Uh, immunity can be transferred to the calf before it's actually born and then through the colostrum. And so we focus our vaccination programs on promoting all of those aspects. So which vaccine would we use? As you can see, there are a variety of different products available. The ones on the left, the Bovishield, the Vista, the Pyramid, those ones are modified live vaccines. And the ones on the right are samples of killed vaccines. I would suggest that you just talk with your veterinarian about the advantages to using these products and which ones that they would recommend. Everybody has their preferences. I know I like to work with companies that have a proven track record that support my clients when they have problems and um, the vaccines are convenient, easy and safe to use. One thing I would really like to emphasize um, with the modified live vaccines is that they should not be used in herds on pregnant cows if you don't have a strong vaccine program. If you use modified live vaccines in cows that just don't have immunity, you can cause abortion and health problems. So we'll kind of review a little bit on how to get your herd up to date and up to speed on vaccines. But just remember that make sure you know what product you need when you come into the clinic to uh, pick it up and that you fully understand the risks and the benefits. This slide just shows some of the different clostridial vaccines that we have. And clostridial vaccine in Manitoba and actually pretty much worldwide is a must. These bacteria are found in the environment. You don't need to have contact with other herds to pick it up. And just as with viral abortions, black leg outbreaks can and do tend to involve the loss of several animals. We also do, do see clostridial infections as a cause of bloats in calves enterotoxic bloody diarrhea. These calves can die before they even have symptoms. We can even see that in cow herds. Um, another thing that clostridias can cause or another disease is swelling of the back end of the cow after calving. Where looking at her, you would wonder if she'd had an extremely difficult calving and yet she delivered on her own. 
that can be a sign that um, she may have a mild clostridial infection and you may want to consider boosting the herd. I've always recommended that if an animal has been vaccinated with a clostridial at least four times in her life, she should be good for life. So I'll recommend vaccination at two months of age, at weaning time, pre-breeding as a heifer, and then once more after that. But in herds that do experience some of the problems that I just discussed, you can certainly give it each year. Now, scour vaccine, uh, these are the three main ones that are used in cows. Neonatal scours is a leading cause of death in young calves. And as anyone who has ever experienced a scour outbreak knows, it requires a significant resource and personnel to deal with an outbreak. So these vaccines can actually help improve the colostral immunity to common scour causing bugs like E. coli, rotavirus and coronavirus. You should note though that they don't cover against every type of scour. Cryptosporidia is a scour that can cause significant losses. Salmonella is also seen and then coccidiosis. So not every scour problem that people have can be prevented by vaccine. But note that these vaccines are just one tool in the toolbox that we can use to prevent scours. So who should get vaccines? Everybody should get vaccinated. And while we did talk about the cow herd, the thing to remember is that protection of the herd is only as strong as the weakest link. If you are missing vaccines in rather the cows, the heifers, calves, or bulls, then you can see some disease problems. Each of those animals or those animal groups can be a source of infection. It's also important to note that different ages or production stages are at risk for different disease. So in the cow herd, we're gonna focus on preventing reproductive loss, getting that cow pregnant and making sure she maintains that pregnancy. When we're thinking about vaccines for calves, we want to protect that group against the diseases that are commonly seen, and that scours, pneumonia, black-like. Um, vaccines given at weaning will boost that protection, and they're designed to prevent pneumonia. I've just put the bulls in a separate slide here because this is a group that tends to get forgotten during vaccination time, or more so I don't think it's really forgotten. I think it's just, it's more difficult to put bulls through a chute. Many of them don't fit. Um, it sometimes can be hard to handle them. And putting bulls in at the same time as you're doing your cow herd, uh, prior to breeding season can be logistically challenging for many operations, but it is very important to make sure that we don't forget about them. I do recall a few years ago, we had a client lost a bull to Black Lake. So obviously, even um, as a young calf, he had not been vaccinated. So definitely skipping this group can cause fatalities. Two diseases that I would also consider vaccinating bulls for would be those for foot rot and pink eye. Bulls need to travel during the breeding season and they need to see the cows in heat. While foot rot and pink eye vaccines are not fully protective and perhaps the duration of immunity is a little poor, they do minimize disease severity and optimize treatment success. The bull may get foot rot but it should be less severe and it should be easier to, to treat and they should recover more successfully. And that's important for us to remember about any of the vaccines is that we, we tend to think that 
they will provide 100% protection, but they don't. What our aim is, is to get most of the herd or group well protected so that we see a much lower disease challenge. And we have to remember that vaccination is a tool for disease prevention. Um, I think a, a lot of us, um, particularly, I guess the one vaccine that takes a lot of um, or gets a lot of bad press is the scour vaccines, because despite using those in cow herds, you can still see scours. And if you don't manage the environment and enhance colostrum intake, then all of those, if you don't use all of those tools, then we just don't get the control that we hope for. But at least keep in mind that the vaccinations will definitely help improve your immunity. This slide here is um, just showing some of the different calf vaccines that are available for newborn calves. The top Enforce 3 and Nasal Gen 3 PMH are used for prevention of pneumonia. And I do recommend that for calves that may be getting pneumonia within the first couple of months. They're the first start to the vaccination series. They do require boosters, and those booster vaccinations are given at a later age. Calf Guard in the center is a rota and a coronavirus vaccine that helps just minimize the losses due to those viral scours. Although it's not really fully protective, it does give a little bit of protection, a little bit of insurance in herds that maybe have not been able to implement a scour vaccine program in the cow herd. The bottom two, First Defense and TriShield First Defense, are actual antibodies that are given in bolus form. And I've had clients have some great success with those. And they're particularly useful during an outbreak. And um, at times that may be one of the only tools that you have for dealing with it. The real challenge for some of these products though is that back orders have been a bit of a concern. So forward planning, talking about your problems, talking about your herd risks with your vet before calving season, is, is always a good idea. Again, it's very true, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Now, I did kind of mention that um, we wanna vaccinate different age groups. And as anyone with children knows, the pediatric vaccine protocols re require multiple boosters starting in early infancy and continuing through preteen years that's in children, but we still, we see that concept in calves where we give them that initial boosting immunity at birth. Then we will top up that immunity at pasture turnout when they're approximately six to eight weeks of, of age. And in this group, our primary concerns are for pneumonia and for black leg. And as you see, there are a variety of different combinations and options available to target the diseases that are of concern in your herd. And I must mention too that uh, not everybody has the same problems. And so it's important to get a diagnosis, know exactly what you're dealing with, and then you can um, go ahead and make sure that you implement a program that works for you. This is a beef production calendar that breaks down when you should be considering different management practices throughout the season. And while this calendar is considered the ideal, it may not work in all operations. The BCRC website and um, some of the um, survey data that uh, they generated revealed that a main reason producers gave for not vaccinating was that it was inconvenient and it didn't work. And I just tell my clients, 
when I make a recommendation, I generally make a recommendation based on the ideal. I want, want you as my client to tell me if you can implement that or if it doesn't work. And we need to be honest. Uh, this is your operation. You need to find some way to prevent disease in a way that works for you. If vaccinating your cows before breeding season doesn't work, well, then we have to look at options to help you vaccinate at a later time when it does work for you. So be honest so that we can um, get your herd on a good program. I'd like to now just sort of wind down my presentation, especially I think we're running a little short on time, just to, to talk about some of the do's and don'ts about vaccination. And firstly, it's very, very important to dedicate your syringes to one use only. You can inactivate your vaccine by using it in a syringe that has traces of other medications so you need to make sure that the syringe that you choose for giving your black leg vaccine is the only syringe you use for black leg vaccine. The syringe you use for a modified live vaccine should be the only syringe that is used for that. Any antibiotic that is remaining in the syringe, any disinfectant, any soap, all of those can inactivate a vaccine or certainly cause it to, to work less effectively. Clean your syringe after you're finished. Old syringes that don't get cleaned get all gunky. Um, they harbor bacteria, infections, they don't work properly. So at the end of your processing day, take your syringe apart and rinse it out in hot water. In this uh, picture here, this is a, a Roux syringe or a Hopner syringe, and those syringes, you can take them all apart. If you have one of the bottle top mounted syringes or ones with the tube extension, just continue to flush hot water through them just to remove traces of vaccine and, and other products there. Replace as needed, always inspect your syringe, make sure that it's um, calibrated properly and that it's in good repair. Here are some pictures of some tools that you can use to keep your vaccine fresh and protect it from the elements. Uh, the one on the top is certainly one of the, the fancier ones and there's lots of good products available on online. This one helps keep the vaccine cool on the one side and it holds your syringes on the other. The styrofoam box in the bottom is just a quick, cheap, easy way to keep vaccine out of the sunlight and to keep it from freezing. If, um, if it's really hot, it should keep your product in a in a fridge or a cooler and only take it out and use it when you need it. The other important thing to remember is if you're using a product that requires mixing, that vaccine can be start to become inactivated within an hour. So only mix as you're using. Don't mix up, you know, for your 300 head in the morning before you head out. I did also want to kind of conclude by reminding you that we are in the business of food production. We need to make sure that we don't give injections in the more valuable beef cuts and that you should avoid the back end. Uh, this picture shows that um, intramuscular injections really should be given just in the neck and the site of that injection, it's relatively small because you need to avoid the nuchal ligament on the top, the shoulder bone, and of course the, um, the spine or the neck bones. The blue shows where you can give subcutaneous injections, that's injections underneath the skin. 
Another area that you can also give subcutaneous injections in with lower volumes is back behind the shoulder. And that can be particularly useful if you are utilizing a head gait that just doesn't have a great neck extender. But now today we've had neck extenders for I think probably about a decade. They had um, a lot of design challenges initially, but there's a lot of good ones out there right now. And um, hydraulic chute systems are also becoming much more common for those of you with larger herds. So definitely that does make giving neck injections that much easier. Don't forget that you should always inject in clean, dry skin, manure and tag, snow, moisture, rain, all of those will allow bacteria and moisture to get pushed underneath the skin or into the muscles as the needle goes through. So you definitely don't want to be using those dirty areas. Perhaps you might have to postpone your processing day if it's raining or if you're using an indoor facility, that does help. But uh, that can be a source of abscessing and infection. And we definitely don't want to see that any roasts or steaks. Change your needles regularly. About every 10 animals, you will notice that the needle seems to drag if it's starting to get dull. Don't hesitate to change it. If you drop your syringe, change that needle. If that needle bends, don't straighten it. Those bent needles are weakened and they're at high risk of breaking off. So definitely don't forget about making sure you're doing those regular changes. So in summary, I'd just like to remind you that whole herd vaccination is the key to disease prevention. And that to remember that you should use vaccines as a tool and that it's important to look at the whole picture, look at how nutrition and feed management impacts disease, look at the environment, uh, shelter, straw, um, management practices like ensuring colostrum, um, it, or colostrum is given. Mark touched on uh, a few tips for calvings and making sure those calves that are born are strong and ready to nurse. Um, look at that whole big picture and, and bring all those pieces together for whole herd protection. And remember that if what you're hearing or reading um, or what you're told at, at your vet office doesn't fit for you, or you don't know how you can implement it, just ask. And we certainly would be willing to sit down and help tailor a program that works for you in your operation. And then finally, if you're going to vaccinate, if you're going to do anything, make sure you pay attention to the details and do it right. And I think that's kind of covered everything that I wanted to chat about. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, for your presentation. Uh, you covered a, uh, a lot on the, the different vaccinations and vaccines that are available and the reasons for, for utilizing them for overall strong herd health. Uh, can you maybe just comment on uh, where you might use vitamin A or selenium or some of those injections at birth for, for newborn calves? Yep, I certainly can. Um, I, I didn't include them um, just because they're not typically a, a vaccine. Um, like vaccines are when, when we're actually stimulating the immune system to respond and your vitamin A and your selenium, those injections are providing um, nutritional elements. What I like to do is give a vitamin A injection to a cow herd in the fall, usually for most operations that coincides with uh, pregnancy testing. And then we will repeat those injections um, when you're running the herd through and giving them a scour vaccination, or perhaps you're doing a late season lice treatment. The key to remember is that vitamin A 
is absorbed by the cow or she gets it from grazing green grass. But once that grass burns off or matures, the vitamin A levels decrease. And in stored feed, that vitamin A does not uh, stay at high enough levels. And that's why levels will start to deplete and why we do need to supplement them. Um, many of my clients are also turning to supplementing vitamin A and the minerals like selenium uh, in the ration. And that certainly can be done. Um, there are some pitfalls with that. But if your herd is eating adequate levels and your mineral is has got adequate levels of selenium, vitamins, copper, zinc, all of those, then you should be able to balance just based on feeding. As far as um, giving the injections to calves, uh, yes, you can certainly give injections at birth. And that I am recommending this year based on the drought conditions that we had last year. Um, we don't usually tend to give injections of the vitamins or selenium before turnout uh, onto pasture. But if um, a herd hasn't come through uh, the shoot system in the previous six months, it might not be a bad idea considering the, the um, feed conditions that we've had this past year and even over the last two or three years. Yeah, all, all very good points. And, and just uh, the importance of nutrition goes hand in hand with a, with a strong herd health program and, and is, is part of that. Uh, we can't emphasize enough on, on balancing the nu nutritional program. Well, one thing too that I just realized I had forgotten to mention is that um, a calf gets most of its vitamins um, through the colostrum. And um, so that's just another really good reason to make sure that um, those calves get colostrum. Yes, thank you. Uh, Pam, did you have any questions for Dr. Anderson? There are none. Okay, well, once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Anderson, for, for your presentation. And uh, also thank you to Dr. Filippo. Uh, and all the best to everyone during calving season. And if you do have any troubles, be sure to contact your, your local vet. Well, thank you for having us. Thanks. I just got a couple slides here that I wanted to share. Here we go. So BCRC is conducting a Canadian cow-calf survey and it's open till end of March. You're still looking for a few more participants. So go to the beefresearch.ca slash survey uh, website and you will be able to, to take part in that. And uh, really like to encourage uh, anyone who's interested in participating to, to check that out. Um, helps to to inform the researchers on different programs and, and deficiencies out in the, the cow-calf industry. Our next webinar will be on April 11th, talking about poisonous plants on pasture. Uh, we'll have an update on the Squeal on Pigs program, where they're tracking and, and trying to control the wild pigs in the province. And then we'll have a presentation on replacement heifer management and development. And if you need any help with your rations, there's still a few months of feeding left to go this winter. We do have livestock and forage specialists across the province. Pam Iwanchesco is in Dauphin. She was with us today on the webinar. We have Cindy Jack in Arburg, Elizabeth in Roblin, Andrea in Clarney, myself in Portage, and Kristen in Beausager. And then if you're needing to sign up for forage insurance or agri-insurance, there's 10 MESC offices across the province uh, that you can stop in and they will help you with either signing up or changing any of your coverage levels. So that concludes today's Stock Talk. I'd like to thank you for joining. I hope you'll join us next time on April the 11th. Thanks.